So what we are looking at today um, is at pulse markets. And as I often do, I will try to move from the aphids to the big wild world. And we will start with some of the outside influences. And I do that because we are a country that lives on exports primarily, and so we have to look at the outside markets to see what the outlooks are. So we'll work our way uh, in from some of the outside influences. We will look briefly at global pulse consumption and what that means to overall supply levels. And then we get very specific on the Canadian side. But before we do that, I'm taking a little side trip just with one slide. And I thought I'd put that in as well. You know, I just said that we don't set the world prices, at least not in a lot of commodities. We sometimes do in pulses, actually. And that's why farmers need to know what's going on in the outside world. And I hope that's what I'm you know, going to explain as we go on. When, but when the dust settles, you know, farmers sometimes get overwhelmed with, with too much detail. And what you really need to know, and maybe that's what you keep in mind when you listen to what I have to say is, where are the market? Where is it in terms of supply and prices? Where is it going? So you know the trend, and that will help you decide when to hold and when to sell, obviously. And those are really the three basic things that you need to keep in mind. And then at this time of year, you also want to decide what you're going to grow, uh, aside from your regular rotation and so on. So as I said, that's just a a small aside, and with that we'll go to some of the outside influences. And obviously I'm starting with India. A couple of people have already had a couple of slides on it. It's very, very important to lentils and peas. So um, what I did though is I put some concerns and some opportunities on here, and I have about three slides on India. Um, and there were some questions earlier too. I mean, the reason the protectionist policies came into place about a year and a half ago is because they had two years of vastly improved pulse production, meaning their own domestic supplies were bigger and the farmers were not too excited to see a lot of product come in from the outside. So the political pressure mounted to stop some of that to keep domestic prices high. So that's kind of the background with that. But when you think on a little bit is that India is fundamentally food secure. They never can completely feed themselves or they have trouble doing so. So when something goes wrong, um, they will have to change the policies, you know, and that's why you have some of these knee-jerk reactions. The monsoon that finished in October 18 is actually 9%, 9.4% short. So it wasn't completely ample. And when we look at the post-monsoon season, so that's um, the end of October until now, it's not a big rainfall season. They only get about 35, 40, 40 millimeters in a lot of their pulse growing yeah. areas. But uh, overall, they're 58% short there and 99% short in central India where they grow or, or grow a, a big bulk of their lentils. So if you start with a short monsoon and then you add a non-existent, in this case in the central area, non-existent post-monsoon season, we know that they're not off to the best start. And you know, so that's giving us potentially going forward some opportunity. They will have um, federal elections in April or May, and we think that uh, before that, they're very unlikely to make any major policy decisions now that will affect the population in the country. And, uh, but after that, I think we might see some changes. So for now, quotas, tariffs remain in place for peas and lentils. And the other thing I highlighted here is they also have stocks. And that's another thing we have to keep in mind. We estimate them at about 3.5, 3.6 million tons. Two million of that are peas um, and about a million tons of pigeon peas. So that affects peas and lentils, uh, chickpeas, not uh, peas. <clears throat> Reba acres, so that's the crop they just planted, are down by about five to six percent. And I think in the end, when all is said and done, they will actually need to buy some more peas and also some more lentils. You know, maybe uh, in, for the total year, a million and a half tons of peas and about 500,000 tons of lentils. So there might be some opportunities. So again, you know, there's likely to be a 10% drop in their own domestic production this year. And when you consider that they consume about 22 million, uh, 25 million tons in a year, round figures, 
and they only produce two million, they will be eating up most of their buffer stocks and they have to maintain by law about a one million ton buffer stock. So you know, it could well be that we have some opportunities coming up there. <laughs> Further on the political front, I'm sure people have mentioned China. And what you see here is, uh, pertains to peace and it's the percent piece we sold to China of our total pea exports. And you can see how China over the last while has become very, very important. Um, to the extent that in the year 2018, I think it's 67% of all peas went to China. And that's because we piled on some feed pea exports this fall something that we don't normally do because America and the US and China were haggling about uh, soybeans and, their uh, and uh, some of their tariffs there. <laughs> China actually stopped buying some of these feed peas at the end of November, but we are still shipping in style um, peas for vermicelli noodles and for some of the edible use. Should something happen to our relationship with China, obviously we're very, very exposed. And you know, that piece of information you take in on the risk side, um, you know, and, and so if they retaliate and it's a lasting retaliation that lasts more than a month or two, it could hurt us on the agriculture side. In fact, I made a slide um, showing the percent of exports for a number of products that we, uh, agricultural products that we export to China. Um, and you know, I mentioned peas is very high, soybeans, 97% of our soybeans go there. <clears throat> Canola is about 46%, flax, 57%, barley, 65% this year, and about uh, eight or 9% of our wheat year to date. So what happens with Huawei and us um, is going to be you know, quite important um, for producers. The other thing we have to keep in mind, you know, um, we, we could say, well, if they buy so much from us, they're also dependent on us. And to some degree, they are. Um, but when we look around the world, um, they do have other avenues to procure a product. For peas, they can go to Eastern Europe, but we should understand here that they can only do that starting next crop year, because Eastern Europe is more or less sold out. Um, so they would have a short-term problem, but longer term, they could go to Eastern Europe. Canola, well, we are the single biggest canola exporter in the world. They could get a little bit from Australia, not much. But there are lots of other oil seeds, and especially, you know, the U.S. is drowning in soybean stocks right now, and we're producing lots in South America. Flax, I'm highlighting Kazakhstan, and we'll talk about Kazakhstan in a while again. Barley, Australia, if they get a better crop in 2019. Um, wheat, well, Eastern Europe and Australia as well. So what I'm trying to say is we do not live in splendid isolation. You know, we have to watch what's going on in the world around us. With that also, you know, world economic outlook, um, that's a, maybe a little more far-fetched. The IMF is saying that the world, economic, the world economy is slowing and it could slow quite a bit more if we start fighting amongst each other in, with trade wars. It's certainly not good for Canada and not good for the world. So I just listed um, GDP forecast for 2019 and in brackets is from the year prior. It's not radical, but it's a bit of a slowdown. And why do we care? Because in the long term, um, gross domestic product often means uh, if it falls that your spend the purchasing power or your spending power drops, especially in countries that spend a lot more income on food than we do, as is true in India, as is true in China. So we keep an eye on that, and that looks a little bit tapered. I also wanted to spend a second to think about competitiveness, because it's not something that we oftentimes do. And it helps you understand what's happening to the market sometimes, and it also maybe gives a little jar to think we need to be involved, what's happening in our infrastructure, and so on. I know this picture is much too busy, but it's just an example of a study that some of our competitors have done. This is one out of Australia, and they're trying to work out what the supply chains look like and how efficient they are and what they cost when you put product through to the end consumer. And this one is, um, has Canada on the top, Australia, Ukraine, and Russia. It had to do with wheat, so that's why they picked those countries. It also talks about um, production costs and did some production cost comparisons. And you can see on the right hand side, po Poland, Russia, Ukraine, these are your um, low cost producers. Why? Partly because their land costs are much cheaper than here. 
When I came here in 1976, land costs were a fraction of what they were now. And we were some of the cheapest producers in the world for wheat, for example. And it was easier for us to compete. That's no longer the case. So we have to be sharp you know, on some of the other things. So to just give you some comparison, in this study they said it costs the Ukraine about $190 in the supply chain, $291.20 for Australia, and about $304 uh, for Canada. So we were the highest cost uh, supply chain in that. And granted, we have the longest inland routes to conquer. There is no doubt about that. You know, most producers in Australia are pretty close to the coast. We are not. Here's something closer to the pulse side. Um, this is data from FAO that comes out of Kazakhstan, and it did some cost of production comparisons for linseed, flax, rapeseed, and lentils. <clears throat> and you can see that the, um, and then it also uh, compared the freight costs into Turkey. And, and we'll see why it was Turkey in a little while when we talk about lentils specifically. Cost of production in Canada quite a lot higher. They had $354 for lentils and $225 uh, $225 uh, for lentils. Mm, big difference. What was interesting here though is although we have a much longer way to get into Turkey, our um, supply chain cost, including the ocean freight, was actually cheaper than the um, Kazakh one because they had uh, a not well-established overland route. It was relatively expensive. But combined with the low production costs, they were still very, very competitive, uh, much more competitive than we are into Turkey. And you can see in, uh, in a little while, as I said, when we talk about lentils, you can see what that did. Um, little dig at cost consciousness, and I couldn't help myself. But do you remember when the Canadian Grain Commission um, announced that they had $130 million extra money over and beyond what they had collected from you and from the supply chain uh, over their cost. So they actually had a little pot sitting there, meaning that they charged more than it cost them to do the job. And now they are doing various things with the funds, but they're not giving it back to the growers or the users. And I think that's wrong. Why? Because it makes us, you know, if I have to add in two bucks instead of one dollar in every calculation, it makes you slightly less competitive. So you have to look at every item in that equation to be sharp, and we can't afford to have little lapses like that. Export capacity changes around the world also change how the trade matrix looks, who trades with whom, who can trade with whom. I can remember when Russia was a big importer of wheat from Canada, and they were equipped to do imports, not exports. In the last 15 years, Canada, uh, Russia increased their ability to export, primarily out of the Black Sea, also a little bit out of the Baltic countries, fifth, by nine, ninefold, nine times. They can export 45 million tons. In fact, they're, they're doing 43 million tons of wheat alone this year, so it's probably even increasing. And they announced last year, uh, that was the um, Ag Minister, that they are planning to increase the, this by 30 million tons by 2022. That's not very far away. And looking at what they've done over the last number of years, you know, we are, tend to believe they can do that, actually. That's a lot. That's the equivalent of Canada's combined canola and wheat exports piled on top. It's one of the reasons, this export capacity is one of the reasons where they now have become the world's biggest exporter of wheat. Not imported, they're now the world's biggest exporter of wheat. This year they will export, as I said, you know, 43 million tons, or did in 2018. In comparison, in a crop year, Durham and, and wheat combined, we do about 23 million tons out of Canada. And what really worries me is they not only have been able to fob that to bring it to load it onto vessels, they also brought this in on rail into their ports, which used to be a major, major bottleneck. So they have done a lot of work on that so that they're able to bring it to the port uh, and export it very speedily, actually, because once they have harvested, their biggest push always is right post harvest because they don't have as much storage as we have. Other countries are doing a lot. Brazil, I talked about that last year quite a bit. They have increased uh, their roadways, um, added a railway. They are adding port capacity almost every year. And you can see that when you watch soybean exports, you know what they have been doing to China this year. 
um, Silk Road Initiative by China. I'm sure everybody has heard about that by now. It's a very, very big deal, and it's designed to streamline not only the exports, it's actually mostly to streamline the imports, what they bring in uh, in terms of resources in the most efficient way, in the, least, in the most cost-effective way, I should say. Here's an example. This is a portion of the new Silk Road. It's an existing railing now, high-capacity railing, from Europe um, into actually um, into China. It goes through Kazakhstan. And mm -hmm. Kazakhstan is an emerging producer of various things. And they have invested, this is Chinese money, $43 billion investment so far into Kazakh infrastructure because they're crossing Kazakhstan to bring it into China. So that's a big deal, you know, that dark dot in here, that's uh, Kazakhstan. And so they have started to take some flaxseed and relatively small amounts of wheat and so on, but they can also take other things once they start producing that. <coughs> I didn't want to seem as if I'm not cognizant that things are happening in Canada. So I added this slide and you know there are a number of things happening at the West Coast. Our grain companies have had good earnings. You know, they earn very good uh, money to fork your grain at primary elevators, and then they earn pretty good money as well um, at the ports, and they have been investing some of these earnings uh, primarily at the West Coast. So Richardson increased terminal capacity, Viterra upgraded ship loading, cargo completed rail improvements, and so on and so on. We have fiber core now. P&H announced uh, some enlargements um, going to happen in the next while. And then, of course, the new G3 terminal, which when finished and fully operational, would add another 6 million tons of export capacity. That's quite significant because right now we do about, we can do 69 million tons. So if you add 6 million, that's very, very significant. What I'm missing is, what the hell are our plans to get the stuff there? <laughs> because we always have breakdowns in the winter, you know, and I think the winter comes every year. <laughs> Last time I looked outside. And we don't seem to be able to handle that, partly because we sold CN, right? We actually do not have a lot of control over what happens on the railroads. We gave that away. And it seems to me that the shareholders are very happy campers, because when I look at what we have built in this country, and who invested in it, it seems to me that the farmers invested a hell of a lot of money in their storage, right? And it's become very, very expensive. You truck a lot further than you used to, also very expensive. So you contribute that to the supply chain. Grain companies, we just looked at some of the major investments. They have rationalized the system. When I came here, I think we had something like 360 elevators in Saskatchewan, that's a fraction of that. When you imagine that at that time, we would trundle around and pick up three to five rail cars at an elevator, string them together and trundle about. Now you do about 85% of all shipments in unit trains. You load them much more quickly. The turnaround is much quicker. That required a lot of investments by the grain companies as well. Rail companies, you know, who benefit from the speed of doing all these things, they're actually charging more than a number of years ago. It seems to me that a lot of that money has been flowing back to shareholder value. You know, when you think about at what share value we sold at CN and what they're worth now, um, I think there was a little bit of um, something. We have to figure out how to do that. You know, there is an, an open link, and it's something that we have to think about in any case. With that, we go much closer to the pulse word. And so here's global pulse production. I haven't heard people talk about that a lot this year. And I think it's worth just mentioning it. What you see here are the major producers over a number of years, starting in uh, 11, 10, 11, I think, uh, into 1819. And what I circled here is Canada. So on the P side, this is for peas. You know, we are pretty important um, part of the picture here. You can see that our production has gone down quite a bit, you know that, you know, since prices fell a bit. And I also circled Russia, the second biggest pre producer in the world, and theirs has gone down quite a bit as well. And that's important because what does it do? I figure that in the 1819 crop here, 
global or the major producers of peas, their production cumulatively has actually gone down by about 16%. And ending stocks for peas were not that huge, actually. So that means, you know, we have about a million tons less in Russia and about 600,000 tons less in Canada. So we went from about 14 million to 12 million ton world production. So that's good when you think about prices. And, you know, that's why I'm pointing that out. Lentil production, yes, yeah, circled Australia, Canada, and then India. Australia and Canada, we had reductions in production, fairly sizable, because we went down in acres last year. Um, the effect is not as pronounced because we had an increase in lentil production in India. So it diluted the overall effect a little bit of what we did in Australia and in Canada. So we are down about 6% numbers, you know, because of reductions in Canada and Australia, but we had an increase in uh, India. So that's positive, but not quite as big as we saw on the P side. And don't forget that we're dragging around big stocks from last year already on lentils that are not all used up. So that's what's holding lentils back a little bit, and that should influence your thinking when you think about pricing, that there are these idle stocks still sitting around that need to be used up before anything radical happens on the lentil side. Just a quick look at chickpeas, and I think Tom already said that by far the biggest single chickpea producer is India, and then the next one, uh, and an important one on the export side for this is Australia. But India pales everybody else in comparison. And here it's worth noting that India's chickpea output is going to fall this year. And, um, same for the pigeon peas, which affects the lentils. And then, of course, we should separate a little bit by desis and kabulis. Um, so the desi supply is down radically because Australian production is down 70% or 900,000 tons this year over last year. So that's very significant. Uh, and that's why India is most likely going to buy some more peas from us because they will need those as a substitution on, on uh, some of the chickpea imports they're not getting. Kabuli situation is a little bit uh, different. Acres went down last year. I think supply will be gone, going down a little bit this year, but, uh, and importantly, when we think about uh, Kabuli chickpeas is Mexico. Mexico has reduced their acres, but they have carry out from last year of 80,000 tons, so that will dilute that a little bit as well. And then we should keep in mind what's happening to chickpeas with our neighbors to the south. And the yellow bars are chickpea production in the States. You can see in the last three years, they have increased that very materially. And that's why they're actually exporting into some of our export destinations, ours in quotation mark, um, and they're buying less from us. And until last year, that was our single largest buyer. You know, so we have to look a little bit elsewhere. So that's a supply picture for North America, or I should say Canada and the US uh, combined, you can see how supply went up. So with that, I want to look at some of the commodities specifically, <clears throat> starting with peas. And that's just a very simple picture showing you acreage seeded in gray, and then the production and exports. And this was the peak production in, um, in 1617. When we, over, when we had extremely good prices and we overproduced pulses in general a little, a little bit. And you can see that we have recovered a lot since then, and I think this coming year will go up a little bit uh, from that. Um, I know this is a, a lot of squiggly diddly, but it's an 18-year picture of exports, and normally we only look at three or four years. And what I wanted to point out is that it's not unusual. We have a lot of variation in demand for various reasons. And um, so I think we'll weather this storm as well. And it also shows very nicely what happened between uh, China and India. We had a total blowout in India, you know, nothing going, not much going, at least not officially, but we had a knight in China, shining armor in China, you know, which took up two million, they will buy two million tons of crop here, which is, uh, you know, a record. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, we do have to worry a little bit about that political crisis, but it's, uh, um, it, it's an impressive picture in any case. That's a little bit more the recent export demand. You can see it's really trending up still, and, and Canada has a big portion of that. And it also points out um, 
as Carl said already too, we are somewhat dependent on the top three buyers. They take about 78% of our product. That's China, India, and Bangladesh. And they're all bulk buyers, right? To, to a big extent, they buy some containers as well, but to a big extent. And that's actually how we get some of our advantage because we can get it there relatively cheaply. Okay, why are sometimes do the exports fall? Because these were Canadian exports into some destinations. And I alluded to uh, Russia before. Um, Russia produces about 15% of the world peace these days. And that's a picture of their production. You can see also somewhat erratic. And they had a big peak exactly when we had a big peak. Why? Because they responded to high prices in the world market, just like we did. And they thought, well, this is great fun, and let's produce some more of those. Um, but what's important to look at is that last year, and I think this coming year, the production will again fall. Why? Because they have had great success in wheat, and with the weak ruble, they have actually been making good money in wheat. It's easy to move. It moves like hotcakes out of um, Russia these days. And I think so they will actually drop a little bit. And on top of that, they have increased the domestic use of peas for feed because they don't have a lot of feed wheat because they exported most of their wheat. So I think we'll see the competition by Russia over the next little while drop a little bit. Um, I wanted to look at market sh uh, shares though, because when we talk about India, and I hear that time after time after time, we say India has up, put up protective barriers and therefore we are selling less. There is more detail to that. Not only uh, is India buying less, we're also getting a lesser share sometimes, and that's a different story, and I think we need to understand that. And that ties into that competitive argument I had at the beginning of the presentation. So just to give you some numbers, and I'm sorry, I'm moving from the right to the left. It was a bit unusual, but it's just how I built the table. Um, in 2015, Canadian peas, 67% of the imports of peas by India came from Canada. In 2016, it was 52%. In 2017, it was 46%. And in 2018, it's 17%. So it's not only that there's a barrier, but it's also that our share has shrunk. Why? Well, we had big competition last year by Russia, for example, early in the year. Um, now the tonnages have changed a bit. I'm cognizant of that as well. You see Russia emerging here and some of the other um, Eastern Europeans. So you know you have to look a little more closely to understand exactly what's happening in the market. In contrast, though, I also put China on here. <clears throat> and China is a little bit different. Because here you can see that in six, in 15, we had 91% of the total market. Um, 16, we had 91%. And in 2017, we had 93%. 2018 data I don't have yet. You can see that we have done well to maintain our market share, even increased it a little bit. Why? Because we have very good freight avenues and access into China. We have boats going with canola, we have good freight rates out of the West Coast, and so we are very competitive into that destination. And that's why we're able to maintain that market share. It's a beauty. However, remember the Silk Road? What would happen if they start railing that on that high efficient railroad from Kazakhstan or from Russia in there? It's a threat, and we have to be very aware of that. So that's why I had some of that preamble there. Exports numbers here to date, we are about the same as last year. We just, um, in this last week, we're a bit over a million ton for bulk exports, so they have increased a little bit over Christmas. And here on the right-hand side, you can see what I expect to do in the whole year. So for 18, 19, I expect about 3.1 million ton and about the same for the coming year is my forecast anyhow. It's not the same as we did in 16, 17. There we were able to do 3.9 million tons, almost 4 million tons. We won't be able to reach that because of India, but I think that's actually not a bad picture uh, under the circumstances. And again, you know, it's thanks to China where we will be shipping 2 million tons. So that's the Canadian peace scenario in numbers. And I know numbers can be quite boring sometimes, but it's important to kind of know the basics, actually, when you're trying to market your piece. 
And the one number that's important for you this late, relatively late in the crop here is that when it's all said and done after our production level supply of 4.2 million tons, my export number of 3.1 million, some domestic use and so on, I think we'll be down to about 280,000 ton carryout. And that's good. That's down from last year's 570,000 ton carryout. So we are actually getting down to some much more bare bones numbers that are very constructive to price. Why am I pointing that out? Just imagine now we have May and India decides they need to undo the quotas and they need to undo the tariff and they want now all of a sudden 200,000 tons of peace. Well, there ain't that many peas left and the Eastern Europeans haven't got that many. So the price effect will probably be quite fine. You know, that's why you want that piece of information, if they do that. If not, you know, I think a 750 that some people have been paying is actually quite a nice price. And it's, uh, you know, already getting us to about 280,000 tons. So we have a smaller carryout this year, which carries forward into the next year. <clears throat> I think we will increase acres eight, by 8 to 10%. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, I should say, in all fairness, think there will, will be no change or a slight decrease. But even with my acreage increase, and if I'm correct on my export number of about 3.1 million tons, next year we'll end up with 216,000 ton carryout, even a little bit less than this year. So that's a constructive balance sheet, meaning that if something unusual happens on the positive demand side, you will see a price response to that. And that's the important thing to remember here. Not quite sure how much the greens will increase. This is um, um, last year's 520,000 tons. I'm sure they will increase a little bit because 1150 bushel are uh, a nice price uh, for green peas. So in terms of... Like if China decides they won't have anything, they won't buy anything anymore. Oops. China has bought year to date already, and that's only into the end of November because we only have destination numbers to the end of November, almost 800,000 tons. So, you know, we are short a, 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 a bit more than a million tons for my target. It would be very punishing. I don't think they will do it actually on, on the piece, but it's, it's a big risk factor. Yeah. Good point, though. You know, as I said, there's a big political risk. It's a big one. Is there anywhere else where you can that kind of volume? With a piece? Yeah. Not that kind of volume. In the best cases, should that happen, India opens up simultaneously because they see peas relatively cheap because it will have an effect on price and they might actually decide to strategically open up for peas then. I think India is already taking some peas. There were four vessels that are loading in January that are labeled Bangladesh. They're supposed to go to Bangladesh. That's a little too much for Bangladesh at one time, actually. I think some of them are meant to end up in India, so they will kind of you know, get some extra permits and so on. Um, but um, yeah, if India buys and China wouldn't, it would kind of cancel it themselves out, right? If China continues to buy and India buys, then you know, we have a very positive scenario. Partly because of that risk, you know, I, I think that you should sell most of your peas at current prices, that's my personal opinion, uh, and be done with it and then start looking at new crop. And even at new crop, um, <clears throat> you know, seven, seven and a quarter, you might want to sell the first tranche if, you, if that covers your cost of production. When prices are not quite as high as we were used to two years ago, you have to be very, very careful with your pricing, right? And you have to make sure that you cover your cost of production. Um, just a little bit of other information, pea fractioning plant. Um, I understand somebody from Roquette is actually here. Um, um, originally, I think they talked about 250,000 tons, but they're going to be buying 125,000 tons um, of peas. Um, there will be some quality requirements attached to that. Um, 
and traceability requirements, I understand. Um, so you will have to you know, find out some of the detail, but uh, Veridin Food is already buying, and there's some others that Tom listed on his slide, but I think it's developing a little bit slower than people had thought, but that increase in domestic market, I think eventually could add up to about 700,000 tons, with, if you add the plant announcements. That will actually be helpful to diversify our demand on peace a little bit. Okay, with that we switch into lentils, and I know there are a lot of lentil producers here. Same graph, uh, acreage uh, production and export side uh, for lentils. Same thing you can see, the big peak here in 1617, where we went all out in production. And here we have um, 18 year export picture for lentils. And this graph tells you why prices kind of collapsed when India closed the doors, because we basically pricked that bubble, right? You can see that you know everything else was relatively even, uh, except Turkey, you know, Turkey was also a very big buyer. But if you take that peak out, uh, you know, all of that extra production, basically we were producing into India. All of that increase was because of price signals into India and then they decided to shut the doors. Um, and there was not a quick fix and we didn't have a China for that one. Um, but not only did we lose volume into India, some people don't realize how much we lost into Turkey as well. And Turkey is our single biggest, uh, our second biggest uh, buyer of lentils. So, you know, what is going on with Turkey? I wanted to have a closer look at that. And when I looked at the players, I discovered Canadian lentil exports to Turkey in 2015 were about 420,000 tons. In 18, 200,000 tons, and year to date, they have taken a piddly 32,000 tons. When I looked at Kazakhstan, they exported 27,000 tons in 2015 and 200,000 tons in 1890. You can see the switcheroo here, right? Turkey didn't actually buy fewer lentils, as people keep saying here. Turkey bought some elsewhere. That's what happens, and that's you know where the competitive element comes in. This is what happened to Kazakhstan lentil area in yellow, production in blue, and exports, right? So that line here is uh, 300,000 tons. So it's not that big, but it certainly has grown, as you can see. They also grow other things. Um, chickpeas, lentils, and peas, soybeans, linseed. We talk about flax to China and some of these things. And you can see, you know, it's not only on pulses. They're managing to increase their production uh, over time as they learn how to do some of these things because they were basically a single crop wheat producer under the Soviet regime, right? But uh, learning to do other things because they have to for their souls as well. So I looked at market shares um, with respect to Turkey as well, right? So the gray boxes are the Canadian market shares starting in 16, we had 93%, very nice. In 17, we had 58%. And uh, in 18, the numbers are much smaller. We're back to 64%, but it's only 190,000 tons. Who was the main culprit in taking away some of their market share? Well, we discovered it's Kazakhstan, 2%, 17%, and 26%. And their tonnage share has gone up from 8,000 to 62,000 to 76,000 tons. Okay? So, you know, that's what happened into that destination. And then there's, you know, Russia, Australia, Syria, some others. For good measure, I also looked at India. And, um, you know, India is a big market, obviously. 82% Canada did, 73% um, and 65%. So we can see a little bit of a deterioration there as well. And that is to Australia. Again, you know, not living in splendid isolation. Uh, we must understand that. So that's what the lentil exports over a number of years looked like. These are Canadian exports into some of our top destinations. And again, we had some pretty volatile swings in the main countries in India, Turkey, um, and to some degree into Bangladesh as well. Year-to-date exports are actually 15% ahead of last year's. That's good, because we need to reduce the carryout. 
And in terms of um, you know, the numbers, what I'm forecasting is in our heydays in 1617, we did two and a half million tons of lentil exports. That was absolutely phenomenal. I think this year we will do just under 1.9 million tons. It's up from last year at 1.5. So that's good as well. And uh, for next year, I think we'll do about 1.8 million tons again. That's my forecast. So with, in terms of the numbers, same as we looked at peas, um, you can see that our carryout is going down. It's much reduced, but it's not gone, okay? So we are going from about 900,000 tons in my numbers to 622,000 tons. And next year I am counting on about even, maybe slight decrease in acres agriculture and agri-forward things will do a 12% reduction in acres. I don't think that will happen. Um, so if I'm right, then we'll be down next year, given my export number at about 350,000 ton carryout. So we're marching in the right direction. Stock use ratio will not be as tight as we have seen for peas. So it's a slightly different scenario. So we call that solid demand this year, and we have re reduced but not eliminated stocks. Um, so in my box, if I'm sticking my neck out, I would sell lentils. Certainly, if I see 20 or 20 and a half cents, which we have seen in some areas, you should sell those red lentils, I think. If you see, you know, anywhere near the 24 cents or 20 cents for the small greens, you should sell those because of the carryout. Now, most of the carryout is reds, um, but still, you know, it, it impacts the whole lentil picture. Um, I should add that I think Kazakhstan will reduce their pulse acres quite a bit in the coming year. They had trouble last year. They don't have a proper cleaning system. They don't have grades, actually. They have quality problems with Turkey. So this is not a smooth road. You know, if you think back 40 years to Saskatchewan, we had to learn these things too. So I think next year we'll definitely have a break, and that should help us a little bit into some of those countries. <clears throat> But nevertheless, you know, as I said, if you see some values that work and give you a return, even a small return, I would sell forward some of the new production as well. It's just a good way to do it. Chickpeas, and I will go through that fairly quickly, and I went to the numbers right away. Um, you know, we reduced acres quite a lot in 2018. I know there were some quality problems and so on. And we increased the acres when the Americans kept increasing as well. So the exports, I think, um, where are exports here for this year um, will be decent, but not as big as uh, some people think. And we will have a carry out this year. And again, you know, I refer back to the North American uh, supply and demand picture. We just increased supply quite radically. Um, Year-to-date exports, you can see in the States, are only at 53% of what we did the year before, and that's because of their domestic production. But we are doing much better into some of the Asian countries and Middle Eastern countries. You know, we have increased exports there. But overall, you know, we are only at 60% of last year's volume, in spite of the bigger production. Um, these are our major markets, Asia, Middle East, and the U.S. And again, I think we'll uh, market a bit more. Um, I should point out the Mexican Kabuli planting is back to about 200,000 acres. They were over 400 last year, but they do have ending stocks. So a lot will depend on what happens in India. They also export Kabulis, by the way. And, um, you know, if they have a major problem, we might actually have a bit of potential for our better prices. I wouldn't exclude that at all on, on the chickpeas. Do we have soybean growers here? Or should I kind of skip over that? Soybeans, I think, are interesting in the sense this is soybean production or acres by province, and that's uh, Saskatchewan is kind of perched on top there. You know, we are relatively small, we are in development. I think the biggest problem on the soybeans is not the market, it's the yield. You know, you need to get yields that is equivalent to some of the Ontario yields and so on to really make it work. You need to get into the 30 bushel range. Um, in terms of markets, China will be your best customer because we are well aligned to ship it through the West Coast into China. I don't think that's the problem. If you produce them, they will take them. But to have profitability on the farm, you need the yield. And that's you know what CDC and Pulse 
um, uh, Saskatchewan pilot scholars are working on. Again, you know, that's the production you add on to the total Canadian picture here. It's in development, I would say. So just some thoughts on next year's acres. And I put all the commodities on there because they have to balance out when it's all said and done. And you can see, I think spring wheat will go up a little bit, Durham will be reduced in production. Canola may be unchanged, although some growers here challenged me on that today and I thought canola will actually go up. So we'll have to see that. Uh, I hope it won't go up too much actually. I left soybeans um, equal. Canary seed should go up a little bit. They're paying 24 cents for that right now, by the way. And then I think, you know, peas will go up a bit as well. One thing that you should do with great diligence, and I'm certain that most of you do, is to look at um, your return per acreage ideas. And don't worry about the very big bar to the left. That's a cover crop I had in there. I should have taken that out, actually. Um, and you can see there's some positives and some slight negatives there. That's over total costs. So obviously, your farm will in, be individually different with yields um, and some of your input costs. When I schedule the over um, variable costs, because when the shit hits the fan, you will look at variable costs. Most of them actually look relatively good. So <laughs> I thought um, it's not as bad as some producers think, actually, or put on. Um, in my slides, there's some of the assumptions in terms of yields and the prices I use. So if you want to have a closer look at that later on. And then I also thought I'd compare this year's prices with last year's prices just to see what happened actually. And uh, you know, when we look at lentils, particularly green lentils, we had about 66% of the previous year's prices. Why? Because we still had something like 34 cents for layered lentils, right? Now that's an outlier. That's not a normal price, right? So you know, that looks a little bit sad, but when I look at red lentils, for example, we're actually 8% higher than last year at this time at the end of January. That surprised me a little bit. And I would say that um, a 20 cent red lentil, 21 cent is almost normal, right? So we're inching up, back up to that. Um, canary seed is up 12%, and uh, uh, peas, green peas are up 30% over last year. And I was using 1063, you can get as much as 1150, depending where you are right now on green peas. So, you know, they've done very, very well. And even yellow peas are 9% higher than they were last year at this point in time. Surprised me a little bit as well. And this is in spite of India. And it tells you, you know, the balance sheet is relatively tight. So, you know, it's actually interesting to make that comparison sometimes. Uh, some conclusions, as I said, I can't help myself but stick my neck out. I think, uh, you know, you should be sold old crop on the peas, uh, new crop, 750 to me, I would definitely be a sale, and even 850 for um, green peas. And on lentils, you know, reds to me is a no-brainer to do some sales for new crop, and uh, greens maybe at 22 cents. Any questions? <coughs> 